Awesome, thank you. Really appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about the work. Actually, this is the first time we've talked publicly about uh, the team's efforts. Uh, but basically what, we, what we've been up to is we've been looking at if we can set up a system that allows us to crowdsource video and photos and, <clears throat> and turn it into a 3D map of the globe, uh, starting with point clouds and then eventually evolving it into, into meshes. Uh, and probably the big focus that we've been working on this is is how can we make that affordable to do? Uh, because traditionally using photogrammetry um, and video and uh, photo uploads to construct these things is really expensive from compute and oftentimes to get the kind of accuracy that we've been looking for really expensive from the type of devices that you need to use it. Um, so we had two really big main goals. One is to see if we could just use commodity devices, things like GoPros, uh, Garmin's uh, cameras, the uh, cameras on your phone for video and photos. Um, and then the second thing to see if we could drive down the compute cost uh, to be affordable enough that we could allow anybody to upload things and be able to compute these um, 3D models and get them to a level of accuracy that would be useful for doing geographic things as well as computer vision things um, in the process of doing it. Um, and then uh, a second big thing we're looking for is, um, uh, is, is the ability to push this out in a really public way. Um, and that's you know, generally been a problem for a lot of these um, kind of second generation mapping applications for things like uh, augmented reality and autonomy is that traditionally we've sent out things like Google Street View cars to collect these and they have IMUs and LiDAR sensors and, and very expensive cameras and, uh, and the cost of these things are, are pretty enormous. I think it's like anywhere between 150 to $700 per square mile in one news report to just process the Google Maps data. Each of the cars can be anywhere from you know, ninety thousand to hundred thousand dollars for a Google car, about a quarter million for an Apple car, all the way up to a million for some of the uh, autonomous mapping, HD mapping cars. Um, so obviously, trying to do this from a crowdsourcing perspective, if you're reliant on this kind of expensive equipment, gets really expensive really quickly, both from a processing standpoint um, as well as just a pure hardware and operational standpoint. Um, and then the second thing that we wanted to do was. Um, really be able to combine a wide variety of, uh, of data sources um, that a lot of times, you know, we get the Google Street View data, um, which looks fabulous, but it's disconnected from the aerial or satellite view that you see in Google Earth, that these two things aren't meshed together as, as one coherent point cloud or mesh um, across them. So that was another kind of technical challenge that we wanted to look at was taking the ability to, to uh, take these commodity cameras and then be able to combine them with aerial data from drones, satellites, um, airplanes and be able to combine that into one cohesive uh, view and one cohesive geographic data set. Um, and again, you know, one of the big drivers for this, again, is cost. Um, that, uh, you know, you can get really large uh, geographies of, of data with, with aerial and drone and satellite, um, but the temporal frequency oftentimes isn't as good, especially for aerial and drones. The number of times you can get in there either by permit or by cost to collect it is quite low. Um, but the geographic accuracy is quite good. You look at like um, uh, three depth LIDAR data, you know, 10 centimeter horizontal accuracy um, can be quite good, but the, how often that data gets updated could be once every 10 years. Um, on the flip side, you get things like camera phones and vehicles and uh, action cameras that are you know, updated daily, sometimes multiple times per day that either a fleet vehicle is coming by with a camera on it or somebody's out snapping a picture or something that could be crowdsourced. Um, so you get great temporal frequency, but the accuracy is oftentimes just GPS, right? It could be anywhere from three meters to 50 to 100 meters off of where it needs to be. Um, so a lot of what we started looking from a technical perspective is if we can combine the best of both worlds. Can we take the positional accuracy of, um, of these survey instruments, um, aerial survey instruments, and combine it with the temporal accuracy of all of these commodity cameras that are floating around taking um, lots of great pictures of things. Um, and so that was kind of the first challenge that we that we dove into was was combining these things together. It's taking the aerial view that you see at the top, it's taking the terrestrial view that you see at the bottom, and then fusing these things together um, to see if we could get uh, a continuous um, perspectives that were high quality across it, and also filling gaps. You know, it's like when you're on the ground shooting with a camera, getting roofs is impossible. When you're shooting from the air, getting really good ground detail becomes difficult. Or when you can reconstruct it from a, from a structure for motion standpoint, it gets into melty Salvador Dali kind of looking artifacts on it. Um, and so then the, the second part of this was, you know, assuming that we could get the, uh, these things to all line up from a, um, from a geomatics and bundle adjustment standpoint, 
computing all of it. Um, and traditionally, the way most folks have gone about computing these things, there is is pretty large chunks of data. Like this is a, a really fascinating paper from 2013. Uh, where Google went through and took all of their global street view data and made a big structure for motion point cloud out of it. And they were actually using that at the time to get better bundle adjustment. They wanted to get better alignment on their telemetry tracks um, going through all these geographic areas, especially dense urban areas where they're getting a lot of drift. Um, and they end up using the structure for motion and the camera poses to reconstruct that and to get all those telemetry tracks to line up much better than they had before. Um, and so they ended up running much sparser grids than you normally see for like an AR autonomy application. But it was interesting to kind of see some of their stats on, on what they were running from just a pure compute standpoint. Uh, it was like four, 404 billion features, 1.5 trillion unique views, and required about 2,000 years of uh, core compute to get that run, right? So again, it's a crowdsourcing project. You know, we kind of look at OpenStreetMap and oftentimes the struggles to get the cluster grown and, and to support the amount of usage and tile serving and things along those lines. We start thinking of expanding um, that kind of concept to doing massive scale photogrammetry with you know, this scale of data, it gets scary pretty quickly from, from an economics perspective. Um, so that was a big thing that we really dove into to see if we could solve. Um, and, and what actually ended up working really well, both from the solution of, um, uh, of the being able to use multiple sources as well as keeping the compute low, is we ended up using these um, traditional aerial survey instruments that we talked about, things like uh, LIDAR, uh, things like aerial, um, aerial clouds, point clouds created from oblique imagery, um, same thing for satellite data, um, also using looking at things like synthetic aperture radar that's already naturally a 3D point cloud, and basically using these things as a reference. Um, so what's the cool thing is, is once you can start to use these things as a reference, you can begin to take that positional accuracy and use them as, think of being a massive set of ground control points. And then we use these ground control points that you know aren't as accurate as say a, a surveyed ground control point, but you know anywhere between 10 centimeters to a meter, depending on which uh, source you're looking at, is still a pretty good rough approximation and way better than GPS that you get off of these commodity cameras. Um, so then it becomes an alignment problem, um, but it's a pretty tough alignment problem because you have one that was taken from a from an aerial view and one that was taken from a terrestrial view, right? So you kind of got these 90 degree angles. Um, where things are really good, and then in between those those two uh, perspectives, they get quite poor. So, like the facade in, a, in an aerial collection is poor, but the facade from a terrestrial collection is awesome. But you're trying to get these two things to match. Um, so that there was a lot of you know interesting computer vision problems that we could have a much longer, more technical talk on. Um, but uh, but those things ended up working out pretty well. Uh, but trying to do that for a massive chunk of data for an entire city that you've collected um, is quite hard. Or if you've run video and collected it for like an hour driving through a city or biking, um, that's challenging from both the aerial and the terrestrial perspective. So what we ended up doing was taking the data and, and chopping it into small chunks. Um, and uh, and the nice thing is is traditionally you know these were done as much large much larger bundle adjustments by some companies will collect an entire city then bundle adjust the entire city with kind of handcrafted ground control points um, and what we found worked quite well is is since we were using a spatial coordinate system um, is that we could divide all of this data into really small chunks and then stitch it back together using the spatial coordinate system um, and then once that got stitched back together then we could use more traditional um, computer vision things like pose graph optimization and bundle adjustment to then align it all to get it pixel perfect or as, as close to pixel perfect as we could. Uh, and here we can see that in action when you go through and take um, a whole bunch of video and then you chop up that video and you do structure for motion and then you take the rough GPS and you throw it onto the map. This picture on the left is what you typically get a whole bunch of strips that have a rough uh, GPS position, um, usually not very good orientation. Um, that are all just sitting out there. Um, so then we take each one of those um, uh, chunks and you see here we've colored them in, in different colors in the middle photo. In this case, we're using 3 up LiDAR and we use that as our reference. And then we go through and use uh, a package we developed called Regista that um, uh, goes through and does all of the orientation and um, co-registration of that data um, to sync it in so it fits in well with our reference system. And then in the last one, we can see that colorized again to see how accurate, how, how accurately we were able to get those things stitched back together. Um, and you see overall, it does a really nice job of laying into what that, that looks like. Um, and then we've also gone through and taken that uh, and generated meshes. This is probably where we've done the least amount of work. Um, 
we've been using, uh, we tested a variety of, of open source uh, SFM pipelines, open SFM, coal map. Uh, we ended up using one out of, out of France called Alice Vision uh, that worked quite well for us, but it's a bit agnostic. The, the pipelines are very mature and quite good. And you can just see the default mesh rendering, which is, which is quite nice. Cleaning up all the like sky artifacts and things like that um, are definitely messy. And it's, uh, you know, oftentimes those are handcrafted. So we're still looking at ways to automate that to be able to do it at, at scale. Um, but good amount of work still there that uh, we can do. Uh, so one of the early experiments we did was to go through and have a, um, a group of friends show up and, and we built a little quick photo mobile app and gave the mobile app up to everybody. And we had about, you know, 25, 30 people go out and just collect pictures of Boulder. And we created a, um, a visualization of that and we're able to crowdsource it in. Uh, one of the things we found was just taking discrete photos um, and having a group. Um, it really depended on how well folks understood photogrammetry and, and taking overlapping photos. Um, and so what we ended up doing as the next stage is, is seeing that was a bit difficult for doing a lot. It took us about an afternoon, a couple of hours to go through and, and build. A, 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 you can see all the green dots here are all the chunks that we did for Boulder. I just reconstructed one area that we went back and, and kind of filled in the gaps for. Um, that you know, uh, going into video might be a better better shot for things. Uh, so from there, we ended up uh, really diving into some of the 360 action cameras and seeing how well that might provide a, a path to go forward with. Um, and this was basically a little over five minutes of me on my bike riding around the same area. So what it took us, you know, a couple of hours to do with folks taking discrete photos with their cameras, we went through and took an action cam, bike through the same area in about five or six minutes and we're able to reconstruct um, something with better coverage. Interestingly, the accuracy is not quite as good from a absolute accuracy co-registration standpoint, um, but still, but still pretty solid. Uh, so from that, we started to think about a strategy of, of really seeding the world um, with, uh, with video data and then filling in the gaps and live updating it with photos. Um, since pe people tend to take a lot of photos oftentimes in the public domain that we could harvest, um, <clears throat> and then those could be reintegrated in using depth mapping, uh, depth mapping, and, and feature descriptors. Um, and then the the satellite or the the video ends up giving you a good baseline. And there's lots of great stuff out there. You know, Mapillary has created a wonderful database of, of video turned into photos, collecting a lot of these areas. Um, there's folks like Carmera that put uh, cameras on fleet vehicles and go out and collect. There's things like Nexar, which crowdsource it off of uh, folks like uh, cab drivers that can uh, push in video. So there's a variety of things kind of coming in that could potentially be leveraged um, against this. Um, oh, that was supposed to animate. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll press on. Um, and so from that, one of the really interesting things was the second part of this was kind of the photo reintegration of, of once you have a baseline um, set of, uh, of images from video frames, you can go in and take a, a photo and reintegrate that photo back into it where you give each pixel a lot long and an altitude. So you can fill in a lot of the gaps, even uh, images that you threw out in the SFM process, you might bring them back in. Or if you have new photos that are updating as single shots, you can give each one of the pixels in that uh, photo uh, an XYZ. And then we can plot that XYZ in Google Maps to roughly see that, yeah, you know where it shows up there, it shows up where it should be. Uh, but we can also go through and do that quantitatively as well. Um, so here what we go through to do is take our three depth LIDAR and we run an RMSE of how well our uh, SFM point cloud aligned to that uh, uh, original survey source. And, and roughly what we've seen, as I was saying before, the mobile photos are a little better. It's about a 25 centimeter RMSE to the survey and the GoPro 360 was about 50 centimeters to the, to the RMSE. Um, so overall, we've found it was a pretty good result. You know, it's probably not good enough quite yet for autonomous driving, but certainly good enough for augmented reality. Um, and also probably things like doorstep delivery where you have robots on sidewalks and things like that where a human life isn't necessarily involved. Um, and we definitely think there's room for improvement. And also these are probably upper thresholds because it takes things like cars, you know, a car in the, in the LiDAR won't be the same car that shows up in, in the photogrammetry um, because they're, uh, uh, transitory objects will throw off your overall RMSE. Same thing with occluded areas. You know, aerial won't get really good detail on some of the facades or overhangs, but the terrestrial will, and that'll show up as error, even though it's really a better ground truth. Um, and that's the other thing we've been doing is, as we roll through this, um, we've been trying to create a perpetually improving uh, ground surface, uh, ground control surface that we can um, 
conflate and co-register to. And as we get more detail in more areas, we can update and say, hey, here's a new set of points that's better than our old set of points. And then the next set of data comes in will become ever, uh, ever improving accuracy. Um, but one of the biggest things for us on this was um, we wanted to be able to open it up to the public to be able to do it. And this is a quick time compressed view of doing that where we have an uploader, we go through and grab a video from Dropbox or Google Drive um, or S3, um, and we push it up into the system. And as it gets pushed up, we have to see a variety of other tests there. The, the frames get split, um, the photogrammetry gets run in the pipeline. Um, that photogrammetry then gets co-registered to our reference set. Uh, and then it gets all stitched back together, bundle adjusted and PGO'd um, and made available as a 3D data set. Now this is obviously time compressed. This was about you know two or three gigs of data that got run through. Um, we didn't want to have a video of you sitting there watching three gigs get uploaded. Um, <clears throat> but here we can see it popping up into the viewer. Um, here we see our photogrammetric reconstruction. We see traditional kind of uh, base maps in here. We can add in our LIDAR um, and, uh, and then bring in our, uh, uh, the rest of our photogrammetry. So you see there's multiple clouds that got stitched in together. Uh, we also had a little feature just to kind of see how the stitching works. You can uh, click on a cloud, um, click your colorize each cloud um, and make that available <clears throat> and see how those things all stitched. We go in, toss this around, uh, and uh, and the team, we'll talk a little bit about the team backside, but uh, Winnie, Winnie Palangor and Chris Helm built out this in 3MAP um, and 3JS uh, with a couple other things. They really wanted a, a super lightweight. And I'm planning on open sourcing all of this once we get a little more time to package everything up and make it look nice. We're hoping might be able to get it done in time for this, uh, but uh, Kubernetes uh, had other ideas as far as putting us into DevOps hell, which um, waylaid that a bit. Um, yeah, a bit about the team, uh, Pramukta, Winnie, Chris, and myself, uh, Steve Coast been advising us um, and giving some uh, lessons learned from OpenStreetMap. Uh, and actually all four of us worked at Digital Globe previously um, and, and over the past year, uh, we've kind of reformed to take a go at, at building out Pixel 8 and doing some things along those lines. Um, so let me see how we're doing on time here. Um, so you got a couple of minutes. Quick minute. if you need them. Yeah, let me... Uh, let me just dive in real quick and show some of this uh, live here, just to kind of be able to take a look. And, and this is on the a uh, bit of the admin system as well as the front ending user interface. Um, is you know all of these collects we have in here are things that we built out recently. Collected um, University of Colorado at Boulder's campus. Um, it was uh, 63 gigabytes of data, 25 linear kilometers over about three hours of biking, trying to get every nook and cranny um of the campus uh and uh here we can see when i uploaded it um we have the video uh in 360 we have the sparse cloud um that we created around it we have the the path uh, that i took through it um and here we can see all the point clouds that we split apart to uh to generate it um we can look at those at a table um where we can see the uh the error metrics we can view each individual cloud um we're gonna have uh, detailed error metrics, such as a placeholder, the one that you saw before, we plan on you know, running that RMSC so you can visualize and see like where your alignment might not have worked out so well. Um, we've also been going through, you know, here's some of the collections uh, that I collected. I might be collaborating with somebody else that's also done collections so I can make sure we're not like double collecting things and we can coordinate, maybe say, hey, let's go out and finish out a spot together. Um, these are also largely a bit placeholders right now, um, although the, the back end is largely wired up. I was have a bit more work to do here. Uh, and then various, you know, admin things that we can go through and do with it. Uh, and then here's the uh, that one of those actual collections on CU's campus. Um, let me go in and and take a look at what this looks like. Really excited what what the team's been able to do. You know, these are you know millions of points sitting in here, and uh, you know what they're able to do with uh, with running these things is really nice from a, just a pure visualization and navigation standpoint. Um, we can bring in the LIDAR, we can bring in the base map, we can bring in the telemetry and kind of look at all that stuff um, as we run across it, um, play around with point sizes, uh, things along those lines. Um, as I uh, talked about before, we can also kind of uh, color the clouds uh, as well, uh, which is nice. And uh, actually another feature that I, uh, I think I left out is, um, you can also download all the data, right? So there's basic ETL on these things for grabbing it in a variety of different data sources and repurposing the data and getting it out there. Uh, one of the ones I was hoping we'd have done is we did a collection of the, the big uh, uh, Black Lives Matter 
um, protests uh, and then mural that came up uh, around Lafayette Park. Um, and then uh, there's also a lot of stuff for the uh, various art uh, and things that went up as uh, part of that building got tore down on the temporary wall that was up. So we'll be able to collect these things in 3D and hold them in perpetuity even as the landscape changes um, is another kind of exciting part of this that we really like. This is just a sparse collection. Um, so this will get much denser and richer, but again, our, our Kubernetes woes kept this from, uh, from fully getting uh, pulled out. But you'll be able to explore these things in 3D, especially when you, uh, you know, if you're not able to go and, and see these things in person is another interesting way to be able to share experiences and, um, and again, historically document things in perpetuity uh, is another kind of cool aspect of this. Um, but the last thing I wanted to wrap up on here, going back to the uh, pages is, again, going back to affordability. So when we ran this, you know, generally if we let our, um, our cluster run idle, um, it's about $100 in storage costs and things along these lines, um, which is relatively low. Uh, when we ran the processing for that whole uh, 25 kilometers of and 63 gigabytes of data for C's campus, it was $145. So it was about $39 um, to process that uh, 65 gigabytes of data. Um, so about a buck 58 per kilometer. Um, so if you think about, you know, Again, the, the Google data was from an article that was from like 2008. I'm sure they've gotten way more efficient, but back then it was quoted between 150 and $700 per kilometer, depending on the richness of, of the data they were collecting, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, we get an order of magnitude drop on that. Um, so we think about that, you know, scaling this out begins to become a reasonable thing, right? Of opening it up, allowing anybody to contribute video and eventually mapping the globe. Um, and we'll continue to push these costs down as we get as we get better at Kubernetes and optimizing these things. But overall, this this splitting of compute, stitching it back together, um, also keeps your errors from going far. Right? When you do a massive SFM model, your errors propagate and they're correlated, which is bad for keeping accuracy um, uh, high. Uh, but when you split these things apart, the errors can't propagate very far, um, and they remain uncorrelated. And when you stitch them back together and PGO it, then you're able to, again, minimize error and also keep costs down, which are two really great upsides of this. Um, so we're super optimistic. Obviously, we're, we're a team of four and, uh, and working, uh, working hard at it, but we hope to be opening this up soon uh, when we get a few of our, our backend uh, hiccups uh, sorted out. Um, but thank you all so much for, for the time and, uh, and letting us share the team's work. Cool. Thank you so much for that. I am I'm literally speechless at just how cool that is. So luckily, we have a whole load of questions come in as well. Um, so uh, let me just go up here. So from Guru Data, we've got uh, as the point cloud is generated from videos and photos, what is the quotes best time of day to collect them? And will the time of day dusk or dawn impact the point cloud generation from the imagery? Um, yeah, so you definitely get shadows in the uh, in the in the photogrammetric reconstruction, um, and there's a whole body of literature if you dive into like the computer vision CVBR world of um, of dealing with it. Um, from a pure photogrammetric standpoint, the best time of day is overcast. Um, so if you don't have the sun creating shadows, your photogrammetry is that much better. Um, otherwise, you know, I I tend to either collect when it's directly overhead because it kind of sits at the apex of the 360 camera and doesn't interfere too much. You still get like kind of rays shooting down. Um, and then the other way to to think about this is that uh, one of the most common use cases for these point clouds that are generated is for uh, visual positioning systems and augmented reality and autonomy. Um, and in those cases, you're trying to reconstruct. You're taking a, a camera view. Um, or a, a single photo, um, and then taking feature descriptors from that and trying to match your feature descriptor database. And there's a whole other set of slides I, I had in here that just didn't have time to dive into of what the accuracy of a VPS is run against this data um, that we've collected. Um, and and, and in, in those cases, you want to get as many uh, uh, candidate feature descriptors as many times a day and as many different seasons as possible to, uh, so that you, you can get a match depending on the time of day that somebody's um, trying to reference against the point cloud. There's also a lot, a whole pantheon of, of machine learning methods for inferring these things too, um, where you can train against a set of data and then you use that to extrapolate for a whole bunch of areas where you don't have multiple photos from different times of the day and different seasons. Um, folks like Scape uh, and other folks in the CVPR world have done really amazing work um, with their point clouds to, to deal with these kind of variations in time of day and seasonality. Um, okay. And so that's another area that we've dove into. 
although I, I just say the really interesting thing that we found with this work is that because of how good we can get the geospatial absolute accuracy um, on this, um, and as a result, also the relative accuracy by um, using just more kind of traditional geomatics methods to just things together, is that we can actually use really naive um, uh, feature matching and feature descriptor methods like just basic open CV ransack and get really good like around two meter results um, from an absolute accuracy standpoint and even better from, uh, from a relative accuracy standpoint. Um, okay. That goes into a whole nother kind of computer vision <laughs> versus geomatics debate that I'll, I'll stay out of yeah. for now. Uh, we've got a, a short question from Will Cadell, which is, are people removed from the product? Yes, that's the great thing is this naturally happens. It's kind of a positive externality of photogrammetry is that um, the way photogrammetry works is that it's looking for all the pixels that are in common between one, two photos or more. Um, and most of the time, unless the person's standing perfectly still and you're circling them, the person's going to get left out just like a car is going to get left out um, because it's moving. Um, that all those motion, uh, pixels in motion will get scrubbed out because they're not stationary anchor points. So generally, all you get at the end as a result is the built environment. Um, and often we will probably want to get rid of cars and scrub those kind of things out because they throw off our accuracy because they're, you know, even if they're parked in the next few, they're not going to be parked. So you don't want to use them as, as a reference or a feature descriptor because they'll throw off your accuracy. Uh, and there's great methods for that too, right? Once you've detected uh, a feature or an object like a car and semantically segmented in the video, you can remove that, drop those pixels out of the photogrammetric reconstruction. So there, there's lots of flexibility in that, but kind of by the nature of photogrammetry, it's it's privatized and anonymized just by the nature of things that move fall out. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got one here from uh, James O'Connor. Do you use an open source or a commercial package for bundle adjustment or did you develop one yourself? Um, yeah, it's, it's a combination of, of, uh, of open source and our own work. Um, there's a variety of, of really cool new packages um, like uh, Open3D. Um, there's a lot of uh, additional bundle adjustment things that we did custom ourselves. Um, there's a lot of things we pulled from academic papers and turned them into code. Uh, so it ends up being a blend uh, of those things and we try to you know, contribute back in those spaces as, 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 we, uh, as we sort things out um, as well. Um, but, uh, but it was one of these things where there wasn't really uh, a good solution that was out there for the combination of bundle adjustment plus um, matching uh, vertical and horizontal, or a vertically collected surface with a horizontally collected surface. There's a lot of stuff we're doing, you know, like fast global matching, um, things like iterative closest point when you have two point clouds that were taken from the same perspective. But when you flip that up, those matchings don't work naturally out of the box. So there was a lot of work that we needed to do to figure out how to make that matching work effectively and fast. Okay, cool. Um, another one from Andrew Bailey, which is, uh, do you foresee any problems with capturing extremely rural areas with no buildings or no nice corners? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely a concern that we had as we, um, as we started. Uh, but one of the things that we found is that a uh, ground maps quite well. Like if you, if you looked at that, um, uh, that Black Lives Matter hashtag that we showed, it was all completely flat and there's no features other than the, the variations in color. Um, or even that courtyard that I was kind of flying around on the campus, the green grass and the sidewalks of that campus caught quite well. Um, and part of that is that, you know, ground surfaces collect really well by the reference. Um, and most of these 360 cameras collect ground quite well just by the nature of the 360 voxels they created around it, the little bubbles. Um, you know, I, I think if it would be tougher if you're purely using photos or, or taking video where you weren't getting a big segment of the ground as you went through. Um, but generally, the, that variation in ground color, as well as um, the perspectives, um, does quite well in areas where there aren't buildings. And actually, I was a surprise. Maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise, but originally, we, we had a bit of the same concern, like when we get to areas where there aren't buildings, that it would all kind of fall apart. Um, but it's, it's worked out quite well to date. I mean, obviously, as we collect more and more areas, we find more edge cases and have to figure out how to deal with them. But so far, so good. Sure. Cool. Um, Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but we've overrun a little bit. Um, but there are a couple more questions. So how can people get hold of you? What's the easiest way to get hold of you? Is it email you or Twitter or? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. DM on Twitter or uh, or email. Um, in the international audience, you know, calls probably are uh, more <laughs> an expensive way to do it. Uh, and I usually ignore everything or I don't know the person because you get so much spam, business spam calls. Uh, but yeah, email is probably the best. Okay, that's great.